Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn. And today we are getting into, under, over, and around prepositions. But first, it's our anniversary episode. Yay! Wow, a whole year! It's been a whole year! Woo! In the lead up to this anniversary episode, we've been asking you to recommend, review, and re-listen to the show. We had the ambitious aim of hitting 100,000 listens for our first year, thanks to your diligent sharing, your diligent reviewing, your diligent listening to the show. Your enthusiastic sharing. There was so much great enthusiastic sharing that happened. And at the time of recording, we are on track to hit that by the time this episode goes up. Thank you so much. There's just like so much thanking happening here. Thank you for listening for this year. Thank you for continuing to support the show. And we're looking forward to year two of Lingthusiasm. In the next few days, we'll be posting an anniversary post thanking everyone who wrecked us in the last month. There is still time to get your name on the list. If you publicly recommend Lingthusiasm on your social media platform of choice or leave a review on your pod feeder of choice and let us know that that happened. Or if you want to just recommend us privately, you can have a warm, glowy feeling that we will confer upon you or feel free to tell us about it. People have also been asking us about merch. Are we going to have any Lingthusiasm themed items that you can adorn your body with? And the answer to that is yes, we now have merch. Yay! Think of this as our one year celebration of Lingthusiasm. We are so excited about this because we decided that we would make merch that we would want to wear or use. So not only do we have Lingthusiasm logo t-shirts and other items, we also decided to make some more fun stuff. So not only do we have Lingthusiasm logo t-shirts and mugs and a whole bunch of other stuff, we also have some Lingthusiast themed items, uh, including a range of products that say, not judging your grammar, just analysing it. So you can wear that on your t-shirt or on a tote bag and promote the idea that linguistics is about analysing uh, language rather than, than judging it. So I'm really excited about that. I'm also the most excited. Um, because I'm someone who doesn't really wear that many t-shirts with stuff on them, uh, especially to conferences and stuff. So I'm the most excited about the fact that we also have scarves. We have scarves in a kind of subtle IPA print pattern that from far away just looks like red and white or navy and white or olive and white. And it just looks like you're this classy person who happens to have an interestingly patterned scarf. And then when someone gets close to you, they're like, wait, are those letters? And then when they get even closer to you, they're like, wait, that doesn't look like the alphabet I'm used to. And then you're like, yeah, it's because I'm a linguist. I've got these IPA letters on my scarf. I'm really excited about my navy scarf. Uh, It's really beautiful. We decided to go with Redbubble for this because they do print on demand, which means that you can choose the colour and size you want. We're less constrained that way. The scarves are are one size fits all because they are giant square of fabric. Mm -hmm. But that means you can use them for versatile purposes if you want to use one as a tablecloth or something, a wall hanging. You could do that as well. Or cut it up and sew something with it. I don't know. Your imagination is there. Um, I have one. It is soft. It is vibrantly colored. I am really excited to wear it to conferences just in time for the uh, linguistics holiday season. By which, of course, we mean the Australian Linguistic Society Conference in December and the Linguistic Society of America Conference in January, and I will be wearing mine to both. <laughs> the, the important linguistic holidays, although I have to say as a Canadian that I celebrate my linguistics annual meeting in May, but I will also be at the LSA. <laughs> so uh, this is in time to wear to conference season. We also, because this is very important to us, they do ship internationally. They have very reasonable shipping prices to Australia, which was important to Lauren. And Canada, which which was important to Gretchen. And we have a link in the show notes so you can conveniently forward it to your friends and fams for the linguist or non-linguist holiday season. I'm excited to hopefully spot some Lingthusiasm fans at conferences. This is probably also a good time to mention, Lauren, that we are going to be doing Linguistics in the Public Ear podcasting panel at the LSA annual meeting in Salt Lake City in January. It's my first LSA. I am beyond excited to be coming to a Linguistic Society of America annual conference. 
Um, I'll also be there presenting a paper in the regular sessions. But yes, we have a workshop on linguistics podcasting with a whole bunch of amazing people. There'll be detailed links in the show notes if you're coming to LSA. Yeah, with other podcasts that you may listen to or maybe you would like to listen to. So we're really excited to see those people and meet meet those people and for you to get to see uh, and meet everybody there. And you're also doing a talk about linguistics outreach at the ALS, right, Lauren? I'm also doing a workshop on linguistics outreach at the Australian Linguistic Society conference in December um, in the pre-conference workshop sessions. So come along to that if you are in Australia. I will, alas, not be joining you for that. Someday I'll get to Australia. Someday, Gretchen. It will happen. (laughs) Someday. Okay. So that's all really exciting. Uh, We also have a Patreon episode this month, which is about the eternal question of what is a sandwich? And we put that question to rest once and for all, thanks to semantic theory, particularly prototype theory. Um, One patron said it was their favourite episode yet, which we were totally chuffed by. So that is up on the Patreon for our patrons to listen to. And we're really close to the Patreon goal of having full bonus episodes each month, as opposed to the slightly shorter ones that we've been doing so far. So if you want to take this opportunity to listen to uh, the back episodes of the bonus ones and get us a little bit closer towards that goal, that would be great. Lauren, what's up with prepositions? What's under with prepositions? Are we over prepositions yet? (laughs) We are going to be across prepositions by the end of this episode, Gretchen. Prepositions notwithstanding, we are going to be into prepositions by the end of this episode. (laughs) So uh, to start with examples, maybe instead of giving you a kind of rote definition of what prepositions are, because people use them all the time. A preposition will be the in, in something like the moose was in the forest. Thanks for the very Canadian example, Lauren. You're welcome. Uh, I think you mean the kangaroo was on the road. Or the kangaroo hopped along the road is another one. The moose stood in the road, (laughs) which is something that happens too often. So these are about spatial relationships. They can also be about time. So if I say I'll be there in an hour, that in is very different. Being there in an hour is different to being in a box. Yeah, and lots of kind of more abstract ones like uh, the antlers of the moose or the the pouch of the kangaroo. So of there is also a preposition, um, even though it's it expresses this possession, this relationship of possession rather than physical location. Yeah. So I was really excited for this episode when we started thinking about defining prepositions, because it meant that I got to pull out my ginormous Cambridge grammar of the English language. Which, like, it is ginormous. It's like about 1,800 pages, right? Yeah, it's 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 like 1,800 pages. It's almost 2,000 pages. <laughs> and it has over 60 pages just about prepositions. Like, this is the kind of detail in this book. Um, it's affectionately known as sea gel. <laughs> And we will continue to affectionately refer to it as C-Gel in this episode. Because, I mean, who wants to talk about, like, the Cambridge grammar of the English language? So C-Gel, which is our friend, which is this massive doorstop of a book. Like, it weighs more than my computer does, (laughs) which isn't saying much these days. But still, it's huge. And it has so much about prepositions that we are not just going to, like, give you a dramatic reading of C-Gel. Although, like, someday, maybe, Lauren, we should do this. (laughs) A a read-along C-Gel. Yeah! like as a Patreon bonus or something, we just like give you a reading of the best example sentences from CGL. Anyway, CGL is great because what it does is it's really taking to heart this idea of being a descriptive grammar of the English language and saying, okay, if you're trying to describe English in all of its glory, in all of its detail, and you're trying to describe it according to sound principles of like stuff you can prove, Mm -hmm. how would you go about doing that? And, you know, 2000 pages later, they're like, yeah, we, we did okay. Of like one particular dialect of English, which is the kind of like international standard-ish one uh, with a few notes here and there on, on other dialects, but it doesn't even try to, to represent all dialects. Although I did learn, one of the things I learned from CGEL is that Australian English has uh, its own <laughs> preposition, which is the preposition bush. Do you have this, Lauren? As in to go bush. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Like I'm going to go bush this weekend? Uh, yeah. Can you say that? It's totally valid Australian English. And, and and what does that mean? 
it just means you're going to go bush to you're going to go to the place where the bush is and spend some time there usually in a relatively minimalist survivalist non-glamping sense i i have like i'm gonna go hiking but like that's different i guess okay because like to me that just means i'm gonna like turn into a bush like it does not it, <laughs> it's like a resultative it's not a preposition okay it is i mean it is a very uh fringe case preposition but this is what sea gel <laughs> does really well as it captures the incredible variety and i think like so we're going to talk you through some of the highlights of what the cambridge grammar of english language talks about with prepositions but i think the important thing to take away from this is actually there are a couple of really basic easy facts to understand about different categories of speech because this is a category of the language but actually grammar is this incredibly fuzzy thing at the edges in the way sandwiches are semantically not always that easy or birds are not always that easy to kind of categorize. Yeah, you think sandwiches are hard to describe? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, th this is the fun thing. So I think a, the way a lot of us encounter grammar the first time is in language textbooks, like, okay, here's a list of all the prepositions in Spanish, you should memorize them. Or in kind of English classes where it's like, okay, underline the prepositions in the sentence. And it seems like there's these very clear answers because they selectively choose for you the sentences that have very clear answers. And what's actually very interesting when it comes to looking at these types of stuff is that the version of grammar that we get presented with is this kind of memorized facts grammar. And the version of grammar that something like CGEL gives us is this kind of scientific diagnostic grammar that says, well, if we've got this set of criteria for what a preposition should be, and we apply this to this edge case, we end up with an answer for whether this particular word that's of dubious status is actually a preposition or is actually an adverb or is actually a, a verb or something else. And so if you like the kinds of arguments about what is a sandwich, this is actually this very similar type of argument, except it's about what is a preposition. Yeah. And like how you end up with a scientific definition that says, okay, you know, a robin is a canonical bird and like a, a bat doesn't go within the bird category, but a penguin does, even though a bat flies and a penguin doesn't because we've got this set of, set of definitions, you end up with this definition of a preposition that sometimes leads us in places that traditional grammars that aren't as experimentally based wouldn't have, wouldn't have left us there with. And so the traditional grammar definition of a preposition is it's a word that goes before a noun or a pronoun. Mm -hmm. That's where the pre comes from. They're in preposition. Yeah. So this is like wrong on both counts. <laughs> and this is what CJ points out. First of all, like lots of stuff goes before nouns or pronouns. This is a wholly insufficient definition. Yeah. So if you have a noun like, you know, kangaroo, you can say the kangaroo. That doesn't make the a preposition just because it can go before kangaroo. You say the big kangaroo and big is not suddenly a preposition. Or you can be like, I see kangaroos and like doesn't mean sees a preposition. So like this is just a completely... Completely insufficient definition. And the other problem is, is stuff that comes after prepositions isn't just nouns or pronouns. So it fails on both counts. And this is a thing that traditional grammars kind of recognize, but just kind of don't really talk about that much. So you can actually put a preposition in front of a whole noun phrase. So yeah. you have like in the house, not just like in house. Fine. Mm -hmm. You can have adjectives. So if you say something like, they took me for dead, dead there is an adjective, but for is still a preposition. It can go before adverbs, like until recently. So recently is an adverb and until is still a preposition. And in fact, it can even go before other prepositions. So if you have something like from behind the curtain, behind the curtain is already a prepositional phrase. And then you have from in front of the whole thing. Yep. And this is one of the places where CGEL is like, uh, 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 traditional grammar, you fail our diagnostics, is you can put a preposition in front of a full clause. So you can say something like, we can't agree on whether we should go and agree on that on is still a preposition by their definitions. Because they're like, well, if it already failed our noun and pronoun test, why not have it go in front of this thing as well? Uh -huh. And even though in a traditional grammar, you call that like a subordinate clause, they're like, look, subordinating conjunctions, maybe not a real thing. Why not just call them a preposition? Because they sure look like prepositions. And this thing that we thought prepositions did, they already don't do. So why not these as well? And the same argument they have for solo prepositions. So if you say something like the resident of this house isn't in the house, yeah. then in is very clearly a preposition. But you can also say the resident of this house isn't in. And the in seems to be like... So it's not before anything. It's not before anything. Whoa. <laughs> it seems to be doing 
basically the same thing as it was before. Like, mm -hmm. it should still work in the same way that you can say something like, I'm eating an apple or I'm eating and eat doesn't have to have apple, even though it could. Um, you could say something like that. So they have this kind of expansive definition of a preposition. But the advantage that it has is that it's a more coherent definition of preposition. And it's one that you can use as kind of a, a lens to test other words on. So they say it kind of canonically or generically generally takes uh, a noun phrase, but the other uses can be seen as an expansion of that. And I think if you think of it as a thing that generally marks spatial or temporal time relationships mm -hmm. that usually goes before an NP, you're actually fine in the way that most of us don't have to think about whether bats or penguins are more <laughs> like birds or not. Um, we can leave prepositions, the, the penguins of grammar, to the grammar professionals who write things like C-gel. So you, you're not actually required to like memorize that definition. That's just a way of looking at that kind of complexity. Yeah. And it, like the definition does have its appeal and the kind of canonical examples do have their appeal because you can say, well, here's, here's your canonical example. And what it does let you do is it lets you give this very exhaustive treatment where they've got like several pages each on the difference between propositions and verbs, the difference between propositions and nouns, and like how you could, how you can decide when you have all these edge cases. So they have, they talk about phrasal stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, so if you have phrases like by dint of, like, I, I I established what a preposition was only by dint of half an hour of talking. Um, <laughs> and so you might think, okay, well, the by and the of, those are pretty clearly prepositions. Yeah. And so if you're like, well, maybe this is, you know, like another kind of, of thing, like, what's the dint doing? So if you think of it like a preposition, uh, you can, but you can't do things like dint of hard work achieves wonders. <laughs> or... She achieved this by hard work's dint. <laughs> so, like, normally you can replace of with the possessives. You can say, like, the photo of me or my photo or, like, mm -hmm. but you can't say <laughs> she achieved this by hard work's dint. No, you can't <laughs> say that in normal English at all. Or the hard work of which she achieved this by dint. <laughs> I think, I mean... It is uh, just worth saying really overtly here, a, a preposition can be more than one word. So by dint of, or well, as soon as... Yeah, they have this whole this whole criteria for like whether these should be multiple words or not, and I'm not <laughs> going to get into that, and like how to analyze the multiple word thing. But for the sake of the take-home message, we often think of prepositions as being those teeny tiny ones like in, on, at, but they can also be multi, mm -hmm. uh, multi-word as well. Well, and they have this interesting argument for home as a preposition okay. a lot of the time. So obviously, sometimes home is a noun because you could say like my home. Yeah. But sometimes if you say I'm going home or I'm home now, that seems to have kind of an inherent preposition mm. inside it. Yeah. You, can't, you don't say I'm in home. No, you don't say I'm in home. And you could say the same way that you could say I'm going inside, which clearly has an in yep. there. You could say I'm going home. Hmm. I'm going downstairs. That's nice. Yeah. And it's like, wait a second. That's... That's so weird, but it it works. It kind of by time you get to this point in the diagnostics, it's not outside of the preposition space particularly. Yeah, yeah. And yet, I don't know, I find that one really hard to, to wrap my head around, but I love it. So the other thing that's kind of cool about the word preposition is that it has a preposition in it. So pre is a preposition in Latin and can be used as a preposition in English. Like you can say kind of artificially, but you can say like, I, I had lunch pre going to the meeting. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a preposition often indicates a position in time and space. So even though they aren't always words that come before a noun, which is where the word initially comes from, they do often indicate a position and pre is one kind. But you can also have like post positions. So these are ones that come after the thing instead of before it. So, for example, a long time ago. Um, ago is a post position there. Yeah, and notwithstanding. So notwithstanding is kind of interesting in English because it can be either a preposition or a post position. You can say notwithstanding the weather, the picnic shall go on. Or you can say whether notwithstanding, there shall be a picnic. And just to be typologically completionist. Uh, you could have circumpositions <laughs> where you have a bit of the meaning before and after. So all of these are referred to 
as add positions technically, although you will often find even a language that has post positions in a grammar for English speakers, they're called prepositions. Yeah, so preposition, although you can decompose it into pre and position, a lot of people don't think of it as separate pieces anymore. In order to be like properly self-defining, these terms should technically be preposition, position post, and circposition <laughs> That's amazing. Uh, make that happen. I don't think that's going to take off. <laughs> I, I think we should make that happen. I don't, I don't see that it would be confusing at all. Just to make them properly, clearly self-defining. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of like how you have prefix and suffix, which I guess should actually be fix suff or something. Yeah. We're working on this. We're working <laughs> on this. Okay. Um, so, and this is one of the things that you can show up if you go to other languages. So Japanese is probably the most famous linguist example of a language that has postpositions. So you would say something like Tokyo ni, which is the same thing as to Tokyo, but the ni comes after Tokyo instead of before. Um, neither of us actually speak a language with postpositions, which is very inconvenient. We should have picked our um, Yolmo, technology a little bit more carefully. Yolmo does. So, oh, Yolmo does? Yeah. Okay. Um, so you say... Um, Nepal la, which means in Nepal, um, or it also means to mm -hmm. Nepal, and we'll talk about semantics shortly. It's not entirely clear. This it is prepositional. It has all the semantics and function that we think of as prep or post positions. But you might recognize that function at the end of the word like that if you speak a language that has case, um, and so case kind of tells you what role the noun has in. The sentence just to give the kind of nutshell definition there and in some languages post positions are kind of the case marker and it's not very clear uh, that there's no separate function for them in other languages you have case and you have prepositions as well i think latin is a language that has both so latin has both case and prepositions so if you use the latin preposition in which is obviously related to the English preposition in, and the word casa, meaning house, you could say in casa, which would be the ablative mm -hmm. case, meaning in or on the house. But if you say in casam, that would mean into or towards the house, okay. because the case differs along with yep. the preposition. So like, you definitely can have both. But in other cases, a language will have a lot of cases for stuff that we might do with prepositions. Yeah. Um, so I think Finnish is famous as having like 14 cases, which sounds really complicated, but that's some of them actually pretty much just correspond to like what you might do with a preposition. Yeah, I remember when I learned Polish, I felt a bit, uh, it was the first language with case that I had learned um, kind of very well. And I think I felt a bit cheated because everyone had always talked about how case was this really stressful thing. And I was like, well, a lot of it is just prepositional semantics. So. The, the the space there is not always distinct. Yeah, so if you look at something like the like the the comative case, which just means the with case, and it just corresponds to most of what you would do with with. It's like okay, with with. Fine. <laughs> Um, one thing I did find difficult with Polish, though, was the semantics of different prepositions. Mm. So you'll often find when you're learning a new language, is that you will maybe get the definitions translated for you at the beginning of the textbook or the beginning of the course but what you find is different semantics come into play and so um, there are two different forms of what roughly get translated as in or to in Polish which is do and na mm -hmm. and you use a different one depending on the place that you are going to so something um, like a shop tends to be used with do and a big open place like a stadium tends to be used with na. So there's like a difference between things you are going to or in that are big and kind of open and things that are small. And it just took me so long to get my head around it. And I used to come with a different set of like uh, examples. I was just, we, just, we could always tell I was going to be a linguist, couldn't you? I'd just be like, what about a cinema? <laughs> and my teacher would be like, mm, how big is it? I think that's door. And then I'd be like, what about an... What about an open air cinema? Um. Oh, no. <laughs> that is peak yeah. linguist right there. Yeah, this reminds yeah. me of there's this thing in French. The preposition you use with a country varies depending on the mm. grammatical gender of the country. Right. So France is feminine, and that means you say en France to be in to be in France. But Canada is yeah. masculine, and that means you say O Canada, and it's not because of the song because okay. it's spelled differently. <laughs> 
And so you have to know the gender of the country in order to know the right preposition to use with it. Except if it's a country that begins with a vowel and it's feminine, then you say ah again. <laughs> yeah, so it, and then if like islands do a different thing because like, and the like, cities do something else. <laughs> Right, so sometimes a preposition will encode information in one language that they don't have in another. So in French, gender is necessary for prepositions. Yeah, so French prepositions often kind of fuse with the definite article, the same with Spanish, and uh, because they're both really small words and they kind of fuse together, and then that means that they start to do things that the article does because the articles encode gender and, and number in those languages. So yeah, there's lots of like interesting ways you can kind of slice up the, uh, the domains of relationships between objects. I just want you to think for a minute if I tell you something is on the fridge. Okay. Where but it's like a magnet. The magnet is on the fridge. Yeah, it's, it's sticking to the fridge. It's got like a, you know, you put up your kid's drawing or your postcard or something on the fridge. Okay. And what if I said the spare fry pan is on the fridge? Well, I don't have fry pan as like a item. But yeah, yeah. So if you have like the bowl is on the fridge, I'm like, wait a second, you can't stick a bowl yeah. to a fridge. I guess you put it on top of the fridge. Yeah, so we have the same on for things that are like either vertically or horizontally. We also have like the ring is on a finger, mm. and that's like a round on. It's not really on, it's kind of that's true. all around. And other languages will cut this up differently. So Spanish does the same, or at least the Spanish that's in my example. <laughs> Maybe you speak a Spanish that isn't. Um, but for Dutch, there are different uh, prepositions. So the picture is and the wall, the mug is up the table, and the ring is on the finger mm. are all different uh, prepositions because they are semantically very different. But yeah, those are different things. Like I, I could think about those differently, but I just haven't had to. Yeah, And I think we do have ways of like clarifying them, right? Because if I say the bowl is on top of the fridge, I can't be like, if I say the ring is on top of my finger, that means something very different. <laughs> Yes, it does. You have very good balancing skills. My other favourite one that I learned uh, in linguistics, not because I know the language, but just because I thought the semantic differences of seeing the world were so great, is that Korean has essentially not an in-on distinction like we have, but a tight fit, loose fit relationship between objects. Mm. So the ring is on the finger and the apple is in the the bowl are different for us because it's on and in mm -hmm. but in korean something that's snug and fit like a ring on a finger or um a pen lid on a pen um or something like an apple in a bowl um would be the kind of that would be a more loose fit or stuff like there's this tumbler that's like things fitting perfectly inside other things yes so it'll be like this apple fits inside this roll of duct tape or something <laughs> yeah. Um, that Korean preposition for snug fit would be a perfect description of what is happening on that blog. <laughs> That's amazing. And then loose fit is like this other thing. So if you have like a, like my watch is pretty loose fitting. Is that tight or loose? I'm, I don't know. I have no Korean intuition. <laughs> you know, uh, yeah. Okay. Somebody <laughs> who speaks Korean, tell us how this, whether like I can fit a finger in between my watch and my wrist. Does that make it loose? I don't know. We'll have to ask a Korean speaker to help us. Okay. But semantics, like, it's not just cross-linguistically. Cross varieties of English, you can get different prepositions that are preferred. And I've, I've got uh, two sentences here. I'm going to have a blank. Mm -hmm. And you need to think about what preposition you would use in these sentences. Okay. So, I am standing blank the platform. I think I would say on the platform. Okay. Okay. And I am standing blank the station. Uh, at the station? I'm second guessing myself now. So I would say I am standing on the platform. Okay. And I am standing in the station. I think I could or say at that the station. Too. In British English, I used to hear all the time in like announcements, so like formal announcer recorded message announcements. If you are standing on the station, please. Oh, I don't have that. Don't litter or something. No, and every time it would just like twing my native speaker intuitions in this like really uncomfortable way. Huh. Yeah, I don't have that at all. No. Because I was second guessing myself being like, is it in or is it at? Either is, either is completely tolerable and then standing on the station. Um, and I think it's just because like 
that they kind of have a Polish sensibility about it being some kind of big, open, you know, standing on the field, standing on the road, Mm. standing on the station. And I'm just like, no. I mean, there's other examples of this. One that I'm aware of is standing. So if I say I'm like, if you're at the bank or something and there's a line of people and you want to wait your turn, you could stand blank line. Oh, yeah. I stand in the line. I stand in the line as well. But in some places you stand on the line. Yeah, no. Only if there's a line drawn on the yeah. ground. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then I can stand on it. Yeah, no, but somebody was, uh, I saw somebody tweeted recently uh, a photo of, uh, I want to say New York City, maybe. Yeah. Um, and there was a sign, you know, again, this very official signage that said, if you're standing on line, blah, blah, blah. Wow. And so this was clearly the, the idiom there. So, yeah, there's all sorts of different things you can do with, with prepositions in terms yeah. of, like, kind of micro variation. And the kind of semantics around that. On the topic of people thinking and talking about prepositions, we would be remiss not to mention the advice to not end sentences in prepositions that is often bandied around. This is okay. It's it's terrible advice, but it's one of my favourite pieces of linguistic terminology. It's one of your favourite pieces of linguistic terminology in what way? Okay, so the angry grammarian sort of story is there are some of the early English writers. So Robert Loth wrote this English grammar in the 1700s. And he has this kind of suggestion that gets transformed into a prohibition. So he says, right, this is an idiom which our language is strongly inclined to notice the preposition. It prevails in common conversation and suits very well with the familiar style in writing. But the placing of the preposition before the relative is more graceful, as well as more perspicuous, and agrees much better with the solemn and elevated style. <laughs> and so... That was very solemn and elevated. Thank direction. you. I try. Uh, it's hard to do quote marks, so I figure I had to sound pretentious instead. So <laughs> his, his shtick was he would take examples from writers like Shakespeare and Milton and so on, where they had done these things that he was criticizing and call them false syntax and say, don't do this. (laughs) Okay. Whatever hobbies you got, mate. (laughs) It's like, have fun. (laughs) Um, But the cool thing about this, like, whole sentence preposition ending thing is that what it's talking about is the difference between something like, this is an idiom which our language is strongly inclined to, Versus this is an idiom to which our language is strongly inclined. Right. And so you have this sense that, sure, our language is strongly inclined to this idiom. And when you you pull up the idiom part and you put a witch there, are you going to bring the two with you or not? Mm-hmm. And so leaving the two behind when you've pulled up the idiom part is known as preposition stranding because you've left it all behind on its little island. Oh, poor preposition <laughs> stranded. And when you bring the two with you, the literature calls it pied piping. Oh. So I don't know, is this a story that everybody knows? I I I always love a good story. So it's because the it's coming with it, so it's like being pied piped along. Yeah, so there's like the pied piper of Hamlin. And the town of Hamlin is, has a big rat problem and they get him to like play his pipe and pipe the rats away. And then when he won't pay them, he takes their children and pipes their children away too. It's a kind of gruesome story. But you can imagine a little, a little bit of grammar playing its pipe and pied piping the preposition up into the sentence with it. Um, yeah. <laughs> Come with me, little preposition. And that is this great <laughs> metaphor. Or how prepositions get moved. Yeah. So basically, the so hypothetically, this rule, you know, could say, don't strand your prepositions, pied pipe them instead. <laughs> and we would be all the better for it. <laughs> don't leave them all alone on their little island. Because <laughs> they get sad. And instead, you should pipe them off into the forest like the children and the rats. I don't know. Um... And like, as as uh, our buddy Robert Loth says, uh, this is a, a thing that English is strongly inclined to. And the idea that you shouldn't do it in English has kind of become this cliche joke that, you know, no reputable grammar guide says says not to. But it's it's got a fun name. So for that, <laughs> I'm okay with it. But, you know, these prepositions can do whatever they want. 
And that's a very different approach to prepositions than what we saw in the Cambridge Grammar of English Language. So there are different ways to approach grammar and some of them are to to tell people to do things in a particular way and that particular way just happens to look like Latin a lot, just saying. (laughs) Or there's the approach where you take a lot of examples and try and understand what is happening from a descriptive perspective and a lot of grammars that fall at many intervals in between those two points. I will say that much as I am in favour of the descriptive kind, the pied piping thing has has an advantage in terms of cool terminology. Definitely. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on iTunes, Google Play Music, SoundCloud, or wherever else you get your podcasts. You can follow at Lingthusiasm on Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and Tumblr. I tweet and blog as Superlinguo. And I can be found as at Gretchen A. McSee, and my blog is allthingslinguistic.com. To listen to bonus episodes, ask us your linguistic questions, and help keep the show ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm, or follow the links from our website. Current bonus topics include the semantics of sandwiches, language games, hypercorrection, how to teach yourself even more linguistics, and you could help us pick the next topic by becoming a patron. Can't afford to pledge? That's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can rate us on iTunes or recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone who needs a little more linguistics in their life. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gorn. Our audio producer is Claire, and our editorial producer is Emily. Our music is by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic! Lingthusiastic!